animated dreams of exploring the solar system. In spacecraft like this 360-ton Mars-bound vehicle, The idea gained funding in the Orion project with the idea of driving a spacecraft with nuclear pulses and landing on Mars in only a month. Concerns about radioactive exhaust helped doom the project. Plasma rockets energized by nuclear reactions were revived in the Daedalus and Nerva projects of the 1960s, and again at the beginning of this century as part of a journey to Jupiter's moon Europa. Rising costs killed that mission. Ben's efforts rely on simpler, far less expensive methods. Their payload has flown all night up to an altitude of over 100,000 feet. The target is. The then, in the yeah. low air pressure, here, the balloon burst and, we'll the turn, and the payload parachuted the right, to the ground. Off trail from here all the way up yeah. to here. We've got GPS wow. units, all the coordinates plugged in. We're about 26 miles from, from here as the crow flies. Uh, we're about 30, 35 miles by trail, last five miles being uh, really uh, off trail, so we're going to have to break some new trail. They know exactly where it is. But that doesn't mean retrieving it will be easy. It takes nearly all day to travel well-packed trails to a point about seven miles from their prize. Payload is marked Oh, so we are heading down south. We are on the side. The rest of the way will take them through forests and over hills. That way is north. Payloads west. We're kind of going. A brave attempt through the deep snow. The team gets to within two miles. The next day, a long hike and snowshoes finally gets them to the payload. To this team, the effort is worth it, for plasma rockets could finally have their day. A real-world test, being designed by the private company Ad Astra, could take place as early as 2016. It fits a real-world need. Flying at an altitude of 350 kilometers, the International Space Station whips around the Earth every one and a half hours. To stay aloft, it must maintain a speed of 28,000 kilometers per hour. But its solar panels and crew modules smack into so many tiny molecules in the upper atmosphere that it gradually slows down and loses altitude. To stay aloft, the station uses up around 4,000 kilograms of fuel per year. That fuel must be flown up from Earth which in turn reduces the amount of food, water, people, and equipment that a resupply mission can deliver. The idea is to use a plasma rocket to help boost the station to a higher altitude, powered by electricity generated by solar panels aboard the station. Ben is also working on lower power rockets for much smaller spacecraft. The idea is to mount them on tiny desktop-sized craft called CubeSats. Based on this miniature model, he imagines sending small solar-powered rockets to remote locations in the solar system to collect scientific data, prospect for minerals, or even look for evidence of life. From there, 
The idea is to one day scale up the technology to power a human mission to Mars. After weeks spent accelerating in Earth orbit, the rocket would make a break for Mars. Cutting flight time from a year to several months would lower costs and crew hazards. Ben's ultimate goal is to help boost a whole new approach to space travel that's now emerging. May 2012 marked a major milestone in the rise of free enterprise in space. The SpaceX company successfully docked an unmanned space capsule with the International Space Station. It followed that up six months later with the first commercial resupply mission. And launch of the SpaceX Falcon 9 rocket as NASA turns to the private sector to resupply the International Space Station. That's just the beginning. NASA is looking to companies to supply orbital launch services and to be long-term partners in future manned missions beyond the moon. Hoping to make big bucks, companies are developing orbital habitats and space planes, laying the groundwork for missions geared to mining, exploration, and even tourism. To Ben, this new race to space will go to the swift and the innovative. Today, because of weather and winds, he and his team have chosen to launch their payload from the spectacular Ruth Glacier in Denali National Park. Amid the rugged terrain, this immense river of ice sweeps down into a perfect natural runway. With dusk approaching, balloon and payload are ready. The balloon drifts up through the dense polar air. With night falling, it rises up to the edge of space. Meanwhile, overhead, a solar storm is raging. Aboard the International Space Station, astronaut Don Pettit is making observations to complement what Ben's team finds. He passes over the Arctic several times during the balloon's flight. The auroras he photographs are an indicator of the amount of solar particles that will pummel Ben's rocket components. This is a time of high solar activity, approaching the peak of an 11-year cycle. This university-based experiment operates on the remote edge of modern science, dominated by large international projects such as the Hubble Space Telescope. The International Space Station or the Large Hadron Collider.
And yet, working small, Ben's team believes they are onto something big. Their goal is not only to open new avenues of space exploration, but to actually seize the initiative. It's a romantic idea of individuals challenging the odds and striking out to new frontiers. With technologies that are getting smaller and more powerful, who will hold back this new breed of explorers?